it's another one of these fancy camera lens watches. I guess I guess they changed up the, the wristband. Now it's like this metallic. Oh, I guess this is actually a different color too. It's like a dark silver. Very nice, thank you. Uh, Tax, thank you so much for sending another one. These are like some of the coolest watches for photographers and filmmakers because it actually resembles like a camera lens, which is very, very cool. Anyways, I have news for you guys. A lot of you have been asking when is the next episode of the Being series gonna come out? And well, production begins Today, if you don't know what the Being series is, it's a little doc series that I started a couple months back, and it's basically the real behind the scenes of what it's like being a YouTuber, Instagrammer, or a social media person. I wanna show you guys what it's like being blank, who, whoever that series episode is on. Uh, the first episode was on Jesse Corgama, aka Jesse Driftwood. If you haven't seen it yet, you should go and check it out. It's probably Probably my favorite video I made in the past year. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it's it's my favorite video. And the next episode is gonna be on drum roll. Potato Jet. I'm gonna be flying out to LA tomorrow to meet up with Gene, AKA Potato Jet. And uh, I'm gonna show you guys what it's like being Potato Jet, which is kind of interesting because I personally have not been to his office or studio yet. So uh, that'll be interesting seeing it for the first time myself and then capturing it for you guys at the same time. All right, so let's talk docs. Since I'm gonna be doing this little mini doc episode of Potato Jet, uh, I wanted to show you guys some of the behind the scenes of what it takes to make a little doc series episode like this. And today is uh, prep day, which means, uh, bring this uh, light on over with me, which means gear. I honestly love talking about gear. And in this first episode of the behind the scenes, uh, that's what this is gonna be about. It's gonna be about gear and prepping for this little mini doc series. But before we can get into all of this, this stuff, uh, first we need to have a, a little talk. We need to first figure out what is the story about and what style are we gonna tell that story in. So for this, I really wanted to be intimate. I, I wanted to feel like you guys are right there with me. I wanted to feel raw, not super produced. I don't want fancy things like gimbals and sliders and transitions and all that stuff. I wanna keep it super, super raw. I want it to feel like it's the real behind the scenes of what it's like to be Potato Jet. So, so with that in mind, let's first talk about camera choices. And because I wanted to feel intimate and not super intrusive into Gene's life, I need to run really small in terms of stuff and crew. And more specifically, I'm gonna be doing everything by myself. I'm gonna be filming, I'm gonna be directing, interviewing, I'm gonna be doing the audio, all of that by myself. This is a one man crew. So I need a camera that fits that kind of shooting style. And I would love to shoot on something like a Red or an Alexa. Alexa, the image is just so, so beautiful. But they're heavy, they're hard to use. You really do need at least one person helping you out if you really wanna get the most out of those cameras. But the C300 Mark II, I find is kind of the happy medium. It's a super nice image. I really like the image that comes out of this camera, but it's still functional in its size and weight and the things that it includes. So instead of going with something like an Alexa, I'm going with a trusty C300 Mark II. Now if the C500 Mark II was out already, I would probably be using that just because of the full frame and the upgrades. Uh, that'll be an interesting camera. But this right here is not too big, not too small, and it has a really, really nice image. And the question is, why am I just not using my EOS R or another DSLR or mirrorless camera. Well, first off, audio wise, I can just plug in straight into camera uh, two mic inputs. I can have a shotgun and a lav mic, for example, put straight into the camera with decent preamps. I have XLR inputs, so I can put real heavy duty microphones straight into this camera. Whereas with DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, that's a little bit harder. Having built-in ND filters, that's really, really huge when you're working on a documentary. It really helps to just, no matter what lens you're using, be able to press one button and you have ND filter. 
Press it again and you have more. Press it one more time and you're taking it away. It's just so easy and fast to use. And then for me, the image is just so much nicer than on something like the EOS R or the Alpha series cameras or any DSLR or mirrorless camera. Uh, having 10-bit 4K and a really heavy duty codec, it, the image is super nice, the dynamic range. And then color grading with footage from the C300 Mark II versus let's say the EOS R, it's like night and day. Day. There's so much that you can do with C300 footage. And that for me is one of those things that I just can't sacrifice. I want the best quality when I'm trying to do these higher end, higher quality productions. I want the best quality that I can possibly have instead of just going with something really small like the EOS R. So we're going with the C300 Mark II. Now let's talk lenses. And for me, I only really need one lens. And again, we're keeping in mind that we want it to feel intimate. So we want it to be pretty wide so it feels like like you're right here, right there with me. Like you're listening in on that conversation between me and Gene, Potato Jet, uh, like you're right there. And on top of that, it'd be nice to have some good shallow depth of field and also for low light situations, it helps to have a faster lens. So my one lens is this Sigma 18-35 f1.8. This thing is the best lens ever made for a crop sensor camera. If you are on a crop sensor, you need this lens. Literally, this will be the only lens that I use on this shoot. It'll be the only lens that goes on the C300 Mark II because it serves the purpose of my story and it just works really, really well. Plus, it's actually pretty affordable. Compared to most lenses, this one's under $1,000 for such an incredible lens. So yeah, I highly, highly recommend checking this out. This is not sponsored by Sigma. Uh, mine's actually cracked. Uh, still works great though. We're off to a good start. Now let's talk about monitors. Monitors are crucial, so important, because it helps you not only to nail things like focus, but also to be able to really see what you're capturing. And that's gonna make a massive difference. Instead of looking at some small, cheap monitor that you can barely see what's going on, I'm gonna use the small HD 502 because this allows me to really see what's going on, what's the lighting looking like, what's the exposure, where's the focus at. This thing is my best friend on a shoot. And the nice thing is, no matter what camera I'm using, I'm so used to the small HD 502 that it doesn't matter if it's a new camera. I can use this, I can trust this monitor to nail exposure, to nail focus, all of those things. Uh, plus I can have my own presets, my own LUTs uh, built into this so I can monitor through my LUT. So it looks like my color graded footage already as I'm filming it. So small HD 502, uh, this one's an old one, but still works great. Uh, that's my go-to for monitors. And then of course you need an articulating arm to attach this monitor. Uh, this one is made by Control Systems, the ultralight. It's not perfect, but I do like it because you can actually buy more of these pieces and extend it or make it shorter depending on your situation. Uh, so I've enjoyed this, but I don't like the fact that I have to loosen a few different knobs to move the monitor into the right place. Still does the job. One step closer to having our rig built out. Now there's one more thing that I like to add on to manipulate the image just a little bit to make it look a little bit, um, a little bit more spicy, a little bit more interesting. That is this black satin filter. What it does is essentially softens up a little bit of that digital harshness that you get sometimes. And at the same time, it kind of blooms the highlights a little bit, just makes them a little bit more appealing in my mind. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my little secret spice, a little bit of secret knowledge there for you guys. Uh, it, it's very, very subtle but still, I love it. It's really nice. Then of course, we need to capture audio and this would be my go-to choice, uh, mostly because it just comes in a really, really cool case. Uh, this is the Rode NTG3 shotgun mic and this is what I mostly rely on for my audio. Again, I think, it's, I think it's a great sound, but also I want it to feel intimate and almost like you were there having that conversation. So the further away somebody is from the shotgun mic, it's gonna sound different as opposed to when they're really close, which is a lot more realistic and that's why uh, I just like to use a shotgun mic. 
Now, just as a backup, it is nice, especially since we have two inputs for audio, two XLR inputs, to have also a lav mic. So I typically just use these uh, Sennheiser EW100 G3, G3s, I guess. These ones, I've had them for like ever. Um, super easy to use. They just work really well. Uh, so yeah, this will be my kind of my backup if the sound is just peaks really high or something, or, or jeans just way too far, uh, I'm still gonna have that lav mic audio also. This would go on jean. Almost forgot, we need a, a windsock. Now let's talk about stabilization. Now before, when I started out doing dock style stuff and I started to you know push the quality a little bit, I started to use a shoulder rig, and this one's a Zakudo shoulder rig. Let me just rig it. Up for you guys real quick. So this one's nice because the C300 handle can actually go here and so you can control f-stop and, and record and stuff like that. And then you have a little follow focus here and they even had this contraption which looks kind of silly and I feel like it's it's a lot heavier than it needs to be. You could actually have one hand on the C300 handle that would be here and then your other hand would be here and you can use this hand um, as stabilization, but also to focus, which was really, really interesting. I actually liked that a lot. But this thing gets very heavy, very heavy. Even if it's on your shoulder, it still gets really heavy. And more importantly, I never liked the angle. I don't like the angle of shooting from the shoulder because that's how we see things all the time. We see them from head level, eye level, and that's kind of just boring because that's what we're so used to. I, a lot of times, like filming from lower down. I, I'm kind of pointing up a lot um, for a few reasons. A, because it's a different angle that you don't normally get to see. And then B, it also makes your characters look more like these big heroes, a little bit more larger than life. So I scrapped this whole thing. I literally have not used this forever. This probably goes in the category of things I most likely should not have bought. And now I'm choosing to be half man, half machine with this thing. This thing's called the Easy Rig. And this allows me to not only stabilize the footage a little bit, it's more stable because I have my hands and then one more point of contact here. And I can kind of push down a little bit to make it real nice and steady. But I can also I can, I can let go of it completely, and all of the weight is actually on this backpack system. So it's actually on my back and not my arms. I don't have to hold the camera up with my arms, which is gonna save me when I'm shooting 10 hours a day, 14 hours a day. I can go all day long with this, whereas if I didn't have the easy rig, my arms would be shot. <laughs> After just a couple hours of filming, even on something like the shoulder rig, it gets tiring really, really fast. So yeah, I could not recommend the Easy Rig more, even though it does look a little bit ridiculous and it's a little bit uh, counterintuitive in the trying to stay light and nimble and intimate. Um, this can be a little bit silly. So this right here is my dock filmmaking mini short series, whatever you want to call this, the being series. This is my rig. I have my C300 Mark II uh, and everything else. And so I can go really low. I can get these nice low shots. I can go higher up um, and I can film like this literally all day long. And now that I have this whole thing set up, uh, it's time to pack it up. I gotta head home, pack up my other stuff, my clothes and all that, and uh, in the morning, we will be heading to LA. Oh, I usually use this Pelican case when I'm traveling. It's just super rugged, everything's gonna be safe. When I'm not doing a lot of traveling, I just keep it in this soft case because I don't have to take it all apart. I can just keep it built in there. Uh, with the Pelican, you do need to take it apart, which is a little bit of a downside. All right, we are all packed. Also forgot my ND filter, so if it's a little bit high shutter, uh, I apologize. I also realized how meta it is that I'm doing behind the scenes of a real behind the scenes in the look of people. It's a lot of behind the scenes. Anyways, it's time to head home, pack up my uh, clothes and stuff and head on that flight. 
I'll see you guys in part two of the behind the scenes.